Making the effort to build positive relationships within your classroom during whole class and student-directed work time is valuable. Don't you agree? Did you notice how work time in particular really freed up these teachers to tend to individual students and to also get a sense firsthand of how they are grasping the material? Big, big benefits. Before we move on from student-directed instruction, there is one final 21st century component that we need to address, computer-based instruction. Technology provides an exciting and up-to-date way to individualize instruction, offer feedback, and allow students to progress at their own rate. Computer-based instruction is most successful when the program is carefully aligned with the standards and objectives established for the unit of instruction. We've identified two indicators for computer-based instruction that help to ensure success. The first indicator states that when instruction is computer-based, students are engaged and on task. This indicator requires a couple of things. The first we've already noted, ensuring that the program is carefully aligned with the standards and objectives. The second requirement is that the teachers must be trained in the use of the software and supported in the integration of the technology into instruction. In other words, the computer-based instruction must be an extension of what students are learning in whole class instruction with the work aligned to the standards objectives. And you have to be comfortable with the computer, the program, and their work, which not only encourages them to stay engaged and on task, but allows you to redirect them when they are not. The second indicator states that, when instruction is computer-based, all teachers assess student mastery in ways other than those provided by the computer program. Most of us have grown pretty accustomed to the instant and immediate feedback that we receive from technology, email, texting, internet searching, it's all at our fingertips. But we also know that there are limitations to technology. There are some things that a computer just can't tell us, and sometimes the computer just gets it wrong. The feedback that we receive from the computer regarding our students' learning only tells us a small part of the story. If we rely on it solely to assess mastery, then we are missing a big opportunity to help students correct misunderstandings, further grasp and apply concepts, and think about their own learning. Often, computer-based instruction programs tell students which answers were correct and which were incorrect, but they do not elaborate on why an answer was wrong or prompt students to reflect on why they selected the answer at all. As their teacher, you are constantly assessing your students' learning. Observing them is second nature to you. You probably aren't even conscious of all the information you're taking in, but you're using it all the time to reteach, to review, to individualize. That is why it is so important to use other methods to assess mastery. The computer is smart, but it doesn't have your sixth sense. In addition to your constant observation, the post-test provides a surefire way to assess mastery and determine where reteaching is required. This brings us to the final indicator of Part 2. All teachers reteach based on post-test results. At the end of the unit of instruction, after three to six weeks of teacher and student-directed instruction, you will administer the unit post-test to determine student mastery of the unit objectives. Because we are always reteaching when necessary, you might find, based on the results of the post-test, that all students, or just some, still require additional help. Let's listen as these teachers discuss the use of formative classroom assessments to inform reteaching in their classroom. We'll start with an elementary teacher who explains how post-test results drive her reteaching, and then we'll continue with the high school teacher's insight. In terms of post-assessments, those are huge because they truly help me recognize what I need to remediate on. Um, especially if I have anything that is uh, in scored out of 100%, anything that scores below 60%, I'll usually take another day to reteach that in small group, reteach that whole group, and then break into small group rotations. That tells me they didn't get it. Like there's the mastery is not there for that, and that's a huge concern. There are a couple of ways we use that test data, especially on you know items and objectives we know that a majority or even just a large number had trouble with. First of all, we make review sheets you know on on the troublesome points. So every child 
you know, gets the review sheets that they can work on. Now, there are some students, our data is, is sorted marvelously. You know, we have a, a, a program, you can use even a spreadsheet, anything to sort every question by the objective it's measuring. So, I, by use of the spreadsheet, I have a detailed list of, okay, this student met every objective under this heading, but missed every single question on this type of standard. I can then pull that kid and say, hey, we need extra practice on just this one objective. And we can either do that before, after school. We also have an embedded period where students are allowed to come for extra help. And I can match that one child's needs you know, to the specific objectives he had trouble with. Uh, I can make those general you know, review sheets you know, as, a, as a whole class. But having that data to look at can really help me pinpoint um, each kid individual needs, which is probably the most powerful part of being able to have those objectives match tests. In both of those clips, you will note that the teachers work together to bring the instructional process full circle. Students really benefit from this practice because it ensures that they have multiple opportunities and ways to grasp the new skills and concepts. That brings us to the end of Part 2, Student Directed Instruction. We'll see you in Part 3, Parent Communication and Homework.